Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, let's make a start. Thanks very much for coming along, everyone. I won't tell you the litany of uh, disasters we had today. First of all, the, uh, the previous lecturer uh, contacted me uh, late this morning and said, uh, sorry, can't come. Uh, so I had to uh, get another speaker. It's only me. Uh, and then at about one o'clock, I found that the original room over there had been double booked. There's an exam in there. So more things. Anyway, we're here. So I'm going to talk about the Society of Apothecaries. And uh, you may well not have heard of the apothecaries, uh, but you'll see that there are two particular reasons why I'm going to be talking about them. And the first one is that the Society of Apothecaries are the original uh, foundation members of the College of General Practitioners. So all GPs ultimately came from the Society of Apothecaries. And there will be another reason that I'm going to be talking about it, uh, uh, that will emerge a bit later. So this is a, um, a caricature by Thomas Rowlandson. I'm not quite sure of the date. It's around 1800 or so. And um, he's obviously satirizing a um, chemist shop, an apothecary shop. The apothecaries were the chemists, if you will, at this time. Um, and uh, over here there is a skeleton uh, behind the curtain and that says poison um, and there's the little dog and Rowlandson has a little dog a rather cute little dog in all of his pictures uh, providing social comment to what's going on basically saying you know how silly uh, humans are and uh, laughing at them so uh, there are caricatures of other people there's Apothecaries Hall. I'll be talking about Apothecaries Hall in London a wee bit later. Uh, and uh, some of these people don't look uh, too flash, as you can see. Well, <clears throat> I want to first of all talk about uh, the makeup of medicine or medical practitioners around the time of Henry VIII. Uh, and essentially, there were three groupings. The first one was the College of Physicians, and I'll talk about them in a moment. The College of Surgeons, at that time called the Company of Surgeons, and the Society of Apothecaries, and I'll talk about each of them in turn, because it's important to have a clear idea of who was doing what and who didn't like what other people were doing, and so on. So we'll start off with the College of Physicians, and they were the elite medical practitioners. They had to have been educated at Oxford or Cambridge, uh, possibly at a European university, but only with special dispensation. But they certainly had to have a university degree, and they were uh, only ministering to the wealthy and the elite. Their fees were very high, uh, and they jealously uh, defended all of their rights and privileges, and their knowledge was basically book knowledge derived from classical authors, Galen and Hippocrates. They never did any dissection in their training. They never had any ward work in their training. So really, uh, it was all theoretical knowledge that they were applying to these uh, elite uh, customers. Now, uh, that was the first group, and they were uh, <coughs> incorporated by Henry VIII uh, at the uh, instigation of this man, who is Thomas Lineker. And Thomas Lineker is a very famous um, person in the history of the College of Physicians, uh, the Royal College of Physicians as it is now, and he was the leading light and uh, pro uh, persuaded Henry VIII to uh, give a charter of incorporation to the College of Physicians. Now the next group are the surgeons. And <clears throat> the surgeons before the time of Henry VIII were uh, lumped together with barbers. They were called the barber surgeons. Uh, and they did more barbering than anything else. They <clears throat> cut beards and cut hair and last boils, did superficial kind of surgical things but they were certainly much inferior to the university-educated physicians, uh, and they were regarded basically as manual workers. Uh, 
Now, when Henry VIII was on one of his progresses uh, through Kent, uh, his leg played up. Now, there's another story associated with Henry VIII's leg. Uh, he had a bad leg, and there's been a lot of ink spilt over the cause of his bad leg. Um, uh, other accounts say that uh, there was a suppurating wound in his leg, which was quite nauseous, a foul-smelling, uh, pussy exudate. So people have speculated that he had syphilis, that it was syphilitic osteomyelitis, and people have talked about the number of um, stillbirths uh, that his wives had, as an instant, that's one of the manifestations of uh, syphilis. And there were other things as well. He was supposed to have a flat, broad uh, nose, and people said that on various um, paintings of his, that the bridge of his nose is collapsing, and that's uh, a fine sign of syphilis as well. Anyway, in any event, he was out in, in Kent uh, doing his uh, progression, royal progression, and his leg was play playing up. Now, a local barber surgeon, name of Thomas Vickery, was called in because there was no London surgeon available uh, to treat his uh, separating leg. And Henry was so impressed with Vickery that he invited him to come to London to continue the treatment. So Thomas Vickery saw this as his great opportunity, uh, and he uh, persuaded Henry to incorporate uh, a company of surgeons. In other words, to separate the surgeons off from the barber surgeons and so this really was the founding point of surgery as a discrete um, entity and uh, this is a painting uh, that hangs in the, the Royal College of Surgeons in London showing uh, Thomas Vickery and all of these other individuals are known as well um, so quite a famous painting now the third group are the Society of Apothecaries and um, the apothecaries were effectively uh, chemists, if you will. They dealt in herbs and uh, other uh, medicines, but they also uh, offered uh, medical advice to people who uh, came along to ask for it, to get a prescription of some sort, uh, and they gave advice as well. Their prime uh, objective was supposedly just filling out the prescription given by the physician. And they were supposed not to give advice. They were supposed just to keep their mouth shut and fill out the herbal prescription that was <coughs> provided by the physician, who may not have even laid hands on the patient at all. May even have only just looked at the urine of the patient. You know, it was sent to them by a servant or so. Anyway... <coughs> Uh, in 1617, the Society of Apothecaries was granted a charter separating them off from the uh, uh, grocers and uh, other groups that they were associated with, and that was given by uh, James I. And in 1617, they became a Society of Apothecaries separate from other groups that they were related to, and I'll talk about them in a moment. And this was part of the charter uh, at the time the apothecaries were part of the grocers, grocers and apothecaries. Grocers are merchants, the business of an apothecary is a mystery, uh, wherefore I think it's fitting that they be a corporation of themselves. A mystery, of course, has got a, had a different meaning in the 17th century. It meant a, an art, a skill, a um, rather esoteric um, form of knowledge. Well, that was the beginning of the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries, which is still going strong in London. And I'll come to the reason uh, for the other reason for talking about them in a moment. So here they are. Uh, it's uh, <coughs> rather like Rotary uh, in many ways. Um, uh, all of the uh, fellows can all get dressed up in colourful drag uh, and uh, wander through the streets of London, and they're allowed to do that with the master of ceremonies um, or... Uh, there's a female currently, and uh, they go to uh, church service at their particular church, which is near Blackfriars, uh, with a very quaint name, St. Andrew's by the Wardrobe. That's the name of the church, and it's in Castle Baynard Ward, quite uh, close to, um, to uh, Blackfriars. Lovely church, really. Some beautiful churches hidden away in the back streets of London to go exploring. Uh, just absolutely beautiful. 
Um, so, now it's one of the livery companies of London, and there are a very large number, there's something like 150 uh, of these livery companies. They're friendly societies. Well, they were set up as friendly societies, again, in 1363, by Edward III, who sta uh, stated that uh, all craftsmen had to belong to a guild. Uh, but they were friendly societies in that they um, looked after their members. Of course, they protected their rights and didn't allow non-members to perform the trade. But they also looked after widows in distress and uh, members who fell on hard times. And so they had apprentices who then, when they finished their time, would become a yeoman and a bit later on a journeyman who was a, a workman. And they were given the freedom of the city and allowed to vote for the mayor. Uh, that was one of their great privileges. Uh, so they're still going strong, and lots and lots of them. Here are the apothecaries. Um, my mother's um, uh, maiden name was Lorimer, and uh, so the Lorimers are there. The Lorimers um, make bits and pieces for bridles, uh, mouthpieces and stirrups and metalwork and so on. And so the bowyers are there. They make bows. The fletchers make, uh, make uh, they put the feathers on the arrows so it will fly straight and so on. And the cordwainers, I'm not sure if you know what a cordwainer is, but a cordwainer uh, is a person who makes new shoes, as opposed to a cobbler, who is different, uh, who repairs them. Anyway, they're still going through. And so there are quite a lot of apothecaries. Um, to Han Sloan, I'll talk about in a moment, John Keats, uh, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, that uh, Megan, uh, our last speaker, talked about, women in medicine, uh, Hewlings Jackson, the neurologist, uh, and Arthur Porritt, and uh, this fellow down here, I'm a, a member of the Society of Apothecaries, in fact, a fellow, and um, um, I have the appointment, the honour of the appointment, as being the lecturer in history of medicine appointed by the Society of Apothecaries to the University of Otago. So there we are. <laughs> That's the other reason I was going to sneak, sneak that in. Thank you. Um, so now let me talk about, about the, the apothecaries. So the word uh, apotheke, apotheke, uh, in Greek means a warehouse, so they were basically uh, storemen, warehousemen, if you will. Uh, the first recorded <coughs> apothecary was the uh, court spicer of King John in uh, 1207. So uh, at that time, uh, imported spices from the East were a very valuable commodities and frequently got stolen, and so there was a particular person who was responsible for looking after the king's supply of spices. Uh, as a, like a warehouseman, if you will. So gradually they became part of the company of grocers. Uh, so they were mixed in with the, the grocers for maybe 300 years or so. And uh, the, the word grocer, of course, has got an interesting origin. It mean, comes from the old French, eau grosse, uh, which means by weight, it's like selling things by weight. That's why it's called a grocer. Anyway. Uh, they, in 1617, they uh, became an independent society. James I gave them a, a charter to separate off from the grocers. Uh, and <clears throat> they were most important because they were the main medical attendants for the sick poor. So the uh, specialist physicians could only be afforded by the um, aristocracy and the very wealthy. The ordinary people had absolutely no hope of uh, accessing a physician. Uh, and so... Not only did uh, the apothecaries give out medicines and herbal remedies and mineral remedies, but they also gave advice, and they took money for that. And, of course, where money was involved, they had immediately uh, raised the ire of the College of Physicians because, um, as in modern medical practice, you know, uh, money is uh, very important. And anyone encroaching on your turf uh, is, uh, gets a pretty rude welcome. So in 1704, there was a famous test case called the Rose Case, where the College of Physicians took the Society of Apothecaries to court uh, over this man, Rose, uh, Peter Rose, who was a, a London uh, cobbler uh, who had been uh, gone to an apothecary and been given advice uh, as well as medicine and had paid a fee. Anyway, the court case basically said that the apothecaries were allowed to charge a fee for their advice as well as giving their medicine. So let me uh, just talk about some of the interesting apothecaries who were the forerunners, really, of uh, general practitioners. This is a book called The Herbalist, 
um, that is in the medical library and it's also in the public library. It's a really good read. Um, so it's about uh, Nicholas Culpepper, uh, who was uh, a very famous early um, uh, apothecary. Uh, he served his apprenticeship or started his apprenticeship in 1634. Uh, it was interrupted by the uh, <clears throat> Civil War and he fought on the parliamentary side, he was wounded. Um, so in addition to working as an apothecary, he was quite well educated and could read Latin. <clears throat> so uh, one of the terrible things he did in the eyes of the College of Physicians was translate the College of Physicians' Pharmacopoeia, the book of remedies written in Latin, so that no one else could read it. And so he translated it into English and published it here as the English Physician, or an astrologico physical discourse on the vulgar herbs of this nation. But it was a direct translation of the Latin pharmacopoeia, and so this raised the ire of the College of Physicians, uh, uh, of course. The other thing about the uh, apothecaries was that <coughs> when the plague hit the London in 1665, that was the biggest plague, uh, all the physicians fled. They went off to their country estates. Uh, but it was notable uh, that the apothecaries, a great number of them, uh, at least stayed in London and treated the poor, or everyone, uh, even though there was the danger of the plague. But the physicians were notable by their absence, and this was well noted by the populace of London. So that's a really good book, uh, and do look at it. And other things by Benjamin Woolley are very interesting as well. He wrote a book on uh, the Queen's Conjurer, and the Queen's Conjurer was Elizabeth I's um, um, conjurer, if you will, um, called Dr. D, and it's another good read. Okay, now moving on to the 18th century, the 1700s or so, we come to a talk, uh, discussion of the uh, Apothecary's Chelsea Physic Garden, which is still a lovely place to uh, visit. So um, here is uh, the area that we're talking about. Here's Westminster, the Thames, and around the Thames there's the suburb, uh, it was in the country at that uh, stage, of Chelsea, uh, and Sir Hans Sloan was um, a, an apothecary. He was one of the apothecaries early on and a great benefactor of not only the Society of Apothecaries but also the British Museum. He left his collection to the British Museum. Uh, well, <clears throat> he owned a manor in Chelsea and in 1722 he leased it uh, to the Society of Apothecaries for five pounds a year in perpetuity and the society still pays him, pays uh, to his estate, I suppose, to someone, uh, five pounds a year. <laughs> uh, and um, for that, they get a four-acre garden in the middle of Chelsea. It must be worth squillions of money. Uh, but it's a lovely place, and you can go and visit it. Uh, and it's still a herb garden, basically. Uh, and that was why it was set up. It was a teaching resource, a herb garden, to teach the student apothecaries. Um, but one of Hans Sloan's <coughs> stipulations was that the garden had to provide um, a, a certain number, at least 50 new plants for the, um, the uh, Royal Society to study. Uh, but that was easily, um, easily um, completed. So do uh, visit the, uh, when COVID lifts. And it's a nice place to walk around, a just beautiful uh, herb garden. Uh, so it's lovely. All right, now another very interesting character is James Parkinson, another apothecary. And the reason I put this book up is that uh, this book is in the Dunedin Public Library, and there's also a copy in the, in the University Library. Uh, the Enlightened Mr. Parkinson. Okay, among other things, he described Parkinson's disease, the nervous tremor. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, he was an apothecary. Uh, now, let me just uh, digress a little bit, because at the, this time, in the early uh, 1700s, the great London hospitals were beginning to open. Uh, the Westminster, the Guy's, um, Middlesex and George's, and the London Hospital. And these uh, were the first large organised hospitals in London, indeed in England, uh, and they provided teaching material for students of medicine that are going to come along. Uh, mainly apothecaries, they're the ones we're going to be talking about, they did not actually provide clinical training 
for physicians. The physicians at this time, and well into the 1800s, were still graduates of Oxford or Cambridge, and they were uh, taught on the basis of classics uh, and not on hands-on, you know, walking the wards. So um, James Parkinson was um, uh, apprenticed uh, as, a, as an apothecary, uh, and he then became a, a, an apothecary surgeon. Uh, and this was a gradual transition where young apothecaries who were allowed to practice uh, their art from the Charter of 1617 were then allowed by these London teaching hospitals to walk the wards for six months and gain surgical experience. And so when they graduated, these apothecaries, uh, they were apothecary surgeons. And just keep in mind that these are the origins of general practitioners. And that, I think, is one of the reasons why the general practitioners still refer to their rooms as the surgery. You know, come around to, this, I'll see you in the surgery. Whereas physicians did talk about, you know, be seeing someone in the rooms. The rooms. Uh, <laughs> but, but GPs talk about the surgery. So, and I think that's the origin of it. Well, um, the uh, surgeons split off from the barber surgeons, uh, the combined barber surgeons in 1745, and then in 1800 they were given a separate charter uh, by George, King George, uh, to become the Royal College of Surgeons. But, met, but at this time, between 1700 and 1800, these apothecaries were combining their training of, with medicine and surgery, and they were now functioning as basically surgeon general practitioners. And many of them were actually working in the wards as well and training young people. Now, the other thing, an interesting thing about uh, Parkinson is that he was a very keen uh, paleontologist and geologist. And he described, among many fossils, this thing called the megatherium uh, in this book that he wrote called The Organic Remains of a Former World. And, in fact, his work in, in geology is really very interesting. So um, uh, he uh, spent his life working in Shoreditch, uh, a suburb of London, and uh, as an apothecary surgeon, uh, he gave the first description of death associated with appendicitis. And, um, and then he described Parkinson's disease. There's a paper that you can look at. Anyway, nice book to read. Well, another famous person who's an apothecary... <coughs> like a, uh, a, a junior general practitioner, shall we say, was John Keats, the poet. And um, so um, we're now moving to 1815. Now, <clears throat> up until this um, time, medicine was gradually becoming more compartmentalized into discrete physicians, uh, the surgeons who were, you know, becoming more exclusive with their own college, and the Society of Apothecaries now doing surgery, but at a <clears throat> sort of general level, should we say, uh, were becoming, um, you know, a discrete body and a powerful, influential body. And <clears throat> so uh, Parliament decided in the very early 1800s that um, med medicine in general, uh, or the professional uh, status and relationship of people in medicine should be uh, clarified. And so in 1815, there was an Apothecaries Act passed by Parliament, a general reform of medical education. And uh, essentially, the apothecaries and the apothecary surgeons were given the right in law to train uh, people to practice medicine. They were given the legal right to do that. And they had that until the 1920s and 1930s, as London University uh, became more influential and started to giving, giving degrees. So this was part of a general reform of medical education, and the uh, diploma that the apothecaries gave was LMSSA, uh, Licentiate in Medicine and Surgery of the Society of Apothecaries, and some very old uh, doctors in New Zealand would still have LMSSA. Uh, <clears throat> it's, I don't think it's any, any longer registrable, but it certainly was uh, maybe 10, 20 years ago. Plus or minus member of the Royal College of Surgeons, so they had that. And 
uh, a bit later on, a, uh, an act defined an apothecary in law as one who professes to judge of internal diseases by its symptoms and applies himself, himself, I suppose, to uh, cure disease by medicine. Anyway, here's John Keats. So, uh, and this certificate is on the wall in the Society of Apothecaries rooms in Blackfriars in London. Uh, and it says, Mr. John Keats um, is allowed to practice as an apothecary in the country. Um, he's an apprentice to uh, Mr. Um, um, Thomas, I think that's his name. Uh, no, Thomas Harmon. Thomas Harmon, that was his name. Thomas Harmon was his, um, his master. And so he was an apothecary for five years. That was his apprenticeship. And he had a testimonial from Mr. Um, Harmon. And um, so he has uh, attended two courses of lectures in anatomy and physiology, two in theory and practice of medicine, two series of lectures in chemistry, and one series of materia medica. And he has spent six months in Guy's Hospital and St. Thomas's walking the wards. So he was pretty well trained for the time in medicine, and he qualified. Uh, but then he, of course, uh, felt the lure of poetry and um, went uh, to Rome and died in Rome of tuberculosis. Well, uh, we find a lot of references to apothecaries. And again, these are general practitioners now, basically, um, in literature. So uh, we've got one in Middlemarch. And um, in Middlemarch, you'll remember uh, this uh, young woman, Dorothea Brook, who's a young, um, very idealistic uh, uh, young lady who's going to change the world. Uh, and she, first of all, is married to a dried-up old um, academic, um, this, uh, this by the name of Patrick Casabon. Uh, and uh, eventually that uh, breaks up, and she is attracted to this young, of course, handsome um, apothecary uh, who arrives in town. This is Tertius Lydgate. And the two of them fall head over, and over heels uh, in love, and that's the story. So Middlemarch, really nice story. Now, this is the television series. Um, so uh, Tertius Lydgate is recognizably an apothecary. It says so in, in Middlemarch. And he's very idealistic. He wants to change the world, but he's uh, really uh, blocked by political intrigue, and that's the part of the story of, of, of Middlemarch. So there's no one that appears in Emma, in uh, Jane Austen's Emma here, and um, here's a quote from Emma. This is the apothecary, Mr. Perry, and there's um, Jane's father, Mr. Woodhouse, her name's Emma Woodhouse. Mr. Perry, the apothecary, was an intelligent, gentleman-like man whose frequent visits were one of the great comforts of Mr. Woodhouse's life. So the apothecary general practitioner was held in, in, in high regard. At this time, it was recognized that the physicians were really dodos. You know, it was widely recognised that, that their, their training in Oxford and Cambridge was totally inadequate to, for, for contemporary needs. Another and very important person that you'll recognise is Thomas Wakeley. And Thomas Wakeley, again, uh, here he is, very uh, aggressive looking fellow, I think. Uh, and he was an apothecary, served his apprenticeship. He walked the wards at St Thomas's. Uh, but his great claim to fame is to found the Lancet. And the name Lancet means to lance in the sense of lancing a boil. And of the two uh, great British medical journals, there is the British Medical Journal, which is very, very um, straight and narrow and, and non-political. But the Lancet basically takes issues with um, things that you know, it sees as being needing to be fixed, take like a dog with a bone, and it shakes it until it gets it fixed. And that was what Thomas Wakeley did. He basically stirred things up. He was out to find any boil in medicine and lancet, and he did it. And he really uh, put uh, a lot of people's backs up. But he was a great shaker and mover. Another interesting fellow. So as we get on later into the Victorian era, again. The apothecaries and the apothecary surgeons, I'm, I'm flicking between those two because not all apothecaries uh, chose to walk the wards and become apothecary surgeons. Most of them did uh, because that enlarged their practice, uh, but not all of them. 
and some of them went sideways. And this one, John Simon, later Sir John Simon, the apothecary again, uh, <clears throat> moved into public health. So he became a pioneer in public health and was the first medical officer of the General Board of Health uh, of Britain. And there were other changes that were happening at this time as well. There was an association of apothecaries and surgeon apothecaries, and that became the Association of General Practitioners in Law in 1834 or uh, There was a thing called the Provincial Medical and Surgical Association. That became the BMA, British Medical Association, which is still going. Okay. And then in 1858, there was yet another medical act which required that all medical practitioners were registered and, in fact, that they had been trained adequately, usually by the Society of Apothecaries. Um, and so uh, the Society of Apothecaries gave uh, granted diplomas. I've talked about the LMSSA and LRCP and so on. Well, there's another one that uh, Megan, our uh, medical student, talked about last uh, week was Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, a uh, most interesting uh, character, the second the first woman to be trained in medicine in UK and the second to be registered. Um, so here she is. She, everyone that met her were impressed by how uh, she was a real go-getter. She was a shaker and mover. She, you know, the um, grass didn't grow beneath her feet, really. Uh, she first, she was determined she was going to do medicine. So she, first of all, uh, because she was uh, blocked uh, when she applied to the University of London. She was blocked by uh, an order of the Senate uh, from registering because she was a woman. So nothing daunted, she enrolled as a nurse in the Middlesex and uh, got some training there. And then she uh, managed to do the course uh, in the course of training in the Society of Apothecaries uh, <coughs> and she became a member and a licensed of the Society of Apothecaries. Well then, uh, Megan last uh, month talked about her career, a very uh, intriguing career. Uh, she had a lot of struggle uh, in, in making her way in a male environment, of course, in London. Uh, but she set up uh, various clinics, uh, mainly for uh, women and children, uh, and particularly the London School of Medicine for Women, which ultimately became the Royal Free Hospital. And the Royal Free when I was a student, and when many of you were students, uh, was kind of well known as um, female-dominated, or at least, you know, with a strong uh, flavour of having me female medical students. The Royal Free was kind of the medical, female medical school, if you will. But very good, of course. Uh, the other thing, of course, is she was very interested in the um, suffragette movement. And here she is, this is her here, uh, with Emmeline Pankhurst in 1910. Uh, so she was heavily involved in the, in the, um, in the uh, suffragette movement. And then when she retired, she got a bit bored, and so uh, she, decided, she retired to Aldeburgh, which is a coastal resort on, on the Sussex coast, Suffolk coast. Uh, so she ran for mayor, and she became the mayor, <laughs> just to pass the time, I guess, in her retirement. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is a lot to do with the British uh, scene, I have to say, in terms of the development of general practitioners, so bear with me. Um, so uh, in the late 1800s, uh, the Society of Apothecaries worked on a fee-for-service basis, uh, if people could afford it. Uh, but increasingly, um, people in society, particularly in the poorer areas of society, uh, formed themselves into friendly societies. They were often related to their work. The factory that they worked in uh, had a friendly society or some other grouping that provided some kind of insurance, uh, health insurance or sickness insurance. And uh, here is a, uh, a cartoon from Punch uh, advertising a splendid opening for a young medical man. So here's the young medical man <coughs> being interviewed uh, by the elders of uh, one of these cooperative friendly societies to decide whether they're going to employ them or not to treat their patients. Well, in 1911, there was the uh, National Insurance Act uh, promoted by Lloyd George, which provided universal insurance. Uh, and here is an advertising poster from the time. So a mail worker paid four pence, uh, and the employer added three pence, and the state added two pence. This is per week. Uh, and in return, during your illness, you got 10 shillings a week for 26 weeks, five shillings after that until you're 70. 
free doctor and medical treatment, 30 shillings maternity grant, and also a sanatorium benefit. So an enormous Im improvement uh, in, um, in, in, in medical uh, coverage for poor people that uh, couldn't afford uh, other things. And so uh, general practitioners, the apothecary surgeons, I'm going to now start to call them general practitioners because that's what they were called in law now. Uh, they were called general practitioners rather than apothecary surgeons. Uh, were increasingly involved in this scheme. And it all came to a head with the National Health Service in 1948. Uh, and this man, and you're in Bevan, uh, who promoted it. And basically, um, it said that the state is now taking over most medicine. That was it. That was what he initially wanted to do. He wanted to make the whole thing completely uh, government. Everyone worked for the state in medicine and the hospitals. Well, there was predictably a great outcry. Uh, people wanted to maintain private practice and some patients still wanted to have private, private coverage and so on. So there was a lot of resistance and a lot, lot of go to and fro. But Anura Bevan was really a very uh, forceful character uh, and he, he bludgeoned it through, really. Uh, and it's an interesting story, reading the, in, the, the story of the uh, beginning of the National Health Service. He just really forced it through and the force of his personality. And here is another picture from Punch. Uh, here are the GPs uh, being uh, given their dose of medicine by Neuron Bevan, and uh, some of them are <laughs> not feeling too happy about it. So, but eventually uh, um, it was taken over uh, and uh, doctors or most general practitioners worked on capitation. So the idea was that you had 3,500 patients on your books per year and you were paid so much per person no matter how many times you saw them or did not see them per year. That was the way it worked. And that worked when, when I was a student as well. So the Society of Apothecaries now, I've, I've traced the history of them going through to be the modern general practitioners, but the Society of Apothecaries is still very active. It doesn't uh, teach medicine per se now, uh, it's mainly uh, involved with teaching. And the teaching that's involved with is mainly history of medicine. That's how I got involved with it. Um, <clears throat> but they do provide other uh, diplomas uh, as well, like the diploma in disaster medicine and um, d d diploma in ethics and legal aspects of medicine as well. But the history of medicine is their main activity. That's uh, why I'm involved with it. So they provided a diploma in the history of medicine beginning in 1970 with papers and theses and oral examination. They have teaching all the way through the year and they've got an association with the Wellcome Institute of the History of Medicine in London and that's the library and um, academic resources that they use. So here's a pestle and mortar from the Society of Apothecaries that belonged to this uh, man John Battersby uh, who was an apothecary in Fenchurch Street and that's in the Society well, let me just uh, tell you a little bit about the uh, layout of London in the 14th century. <laughs> you may not think that's relevant, but the Society of Apothecaries now uh, have their um, meeting uh, place in Blackfriars. That's what I'm going to tell you about. So here is London, around 1300 or so, and here is the old walled city of London with the tower here, and the wall had gates in it. Old Gate, Bishop's Gate, Moor Gate, Cripple Gate, Alders Gate, New Gate and so on. And um, there was a, a river called the Fleet River, which was a discrete river. And there was a Fleet Prison uh, here until the uh, 1900s. Um, and um, then a bit up here was another prison called Newgate. Uh, well, that was the old city. Now, in the city, there were various religious orders and the one we're going to be most interested in are the Dominicans, called the Black Friars, because they had a black robe. Uh, but there were the White Friars, who were the Carmelites, and they had a, um, uh, an abbey uh, here as well. These were all abbeys. Uh, the Grey Friars uh, here were the Franciscans, uh, and then the Augustan Friars, the Austin Friars as well, and, and various other groups as well. Uh, and then... So here is here, uh, the House of Parliament over here, or what will later be the House of Parliament around Westminster, but further around. Uh, so this uh, is the area we're going to be looking at, the Blackfriars. So here it is, uh, the Blackfriars there. There's the old London Bridge. There's now a bridge going across here with a train, an underground connection. So um, 
that was until uh, Henry VIII came along. In 1540, Henry decided that he would dissolve all the monasteries and grab all the cash, because there was quite a lot of loot involved, a lot of money. And uh, so he dissolved them, took all the money. Um, and uh, the Society of Apothecaries then uh, developed uh, their influence. Uh, and this uh, monastery of Black Friars uh, was basically put up for sale. And the Society of Apothecaries acquired it uh, and then rebuilt it. And here it is. Uh, it's tucked away in a little side street. Uh, Blackfriars Underground Station's over here. And uh, there it is, that's Blackfriars there on the, on the uh, circle line that you can see. Right next to a bridge, and here's Blackfriars here. The Fleet River is all, it, uh, by the 1900s, it became, a, it became a ditch of everyone threw all their rubbish and, and feces and everything in it. Uh, it. It still exists as a drain underneath Fenchurch Street, the Fleet River. Well, going through that uh, 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 archway, go through this archway, it's a, just an absolutely beautiful um, uh, hall, the Apothecary's Hall. Here is the quadrangle with uh, students, uh, history of medicine students. I was one of them a few years ago. Uh, and just wandering around in a break. Inside, it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, so this is the entrance hall uh, and uh, with oak lining and um, linen fold uh, panelling uh, and the stairs to the upstairs meeting rooms uh, with various luminaries uh, around as well. So all the lectures in history of medicine are held here. Uh, this is one of the main lecture rooms so there's a picture of Hans Sloan, uh, and there are other worthies around the walls, but just absolutely beautiful. So students kind of sit in here with their desks and uh, get lectured just like this. It's just a most marvelous exam. And then you have to do a thesis, and <clears throat> then there's a written series of papers, the written examination, and the examination room. That's the examination room, uh, which is kind of nice as well, again, with well-known figures all the way around the, the walls. So um, I've uh, tried to trace the um, history of general practitioners uh, from their origins, uh, uh, ultimately, or originally, as apothecaries, or even earlier than that, as spicers, if you will, uh, grocers involved with herbs and spices, gradually separating off to become uh, people just dealing in herbs and then giving uh, advice um, until ultimately they became the uh, what we recognize today as the general practitioner, uh, again giving advice. This side of apothecaries no longer uh, makes uh, medicines, it did until the 1920s or so, but no longer just does history of medicine talks. So thanks very much for your attention. And um, if you want to contact me uh, or make a comment about it, this, that's me. So thanks very much for your attention. Questions? Questions? It's not so much a question. Sorry. Oh, there's just one lady at the back. Go ahead. Oh, not so much a question, but I Sorry. went to a formal dinner in the Society of Apothecaries in 1960 when Sir Arthur Porrock was the master, and it was a very grand affair mm. in that hall. Yes. Where yeah, right. you were introduced formally at the top of the stairs. Doctor so and so and Miss so and so etc. We were to <coughs> shook hands with uh, Sir Arthur, and uh, the dinner itself was really quite formal with such things as pheasant, which I've never had before <laughs> on the menu. But also, they have some strange traditions where they pass a so-called loving cup, which was a large vessel which everyone, unhygienically I might say, drank from and passed on to the next person. But the person who had, on either side of the person drinking, stood guard while the person drinking it was imbibing. Very strange. <laughs> yes, but of course that makes the whole, as to the mystique the of the whole world. thing, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Yeah. But it's a beautiful building, isn't it? It's lovely inside. That's right, yes, they have... Uh, 
every time um, they have a lecture like this, they have a series of lectures just like this, and then afterwards they have a feast, as they call it, the feast, so get out the crystal and the silver chandeliers and candelier up and so on. So, yes? I should declare allegiance first that I'm a retired pharmacy. Mm. I trust it was for the sake of brevity that the word pharmacy never crossed your lips during mm. the whole talk. No, not, not really. It wasn't really conscious. Um, but the pharmacists, per se... So, um, if we go back maybe to the 1850s, 1860s or so, the apothecaries were the pharmacists. In other words, they um, dealt in herbs and, and medicinal remedies or so. So by the 1900s, early 1900s, um, a distinct group of pharmacists, people just manufacturing uh, remedies, uh, sort of arose and separated themselves off from the apothecary surgeons who were uh, they, they made their own remedies, but they were more involved with actually treating patients. So, and then the farmers, so the Society of Apothecaries actually manufactured medicines in their rooms, in, in, the, in the hall, in the basement, uh, until the 1920s. But the pharmacists, as a specialist group, kind of separated off, making their own medicines. And then, of course, they were involved with the scientific aspects of pharmacy as well analyzing what was actually in the substances and so on and so they became uh, a different group it wasn't a conscious um, denial of them yeah you might comment that this is a, a very uh, English slanted story yeah it is uh, it is there's a huge uh, uh, apothecary museum in Heidelberg in Germany so yes. it must have been a parallel absolutely development of absolutely absolutely I mean um, something of interest for the future might be to look at um, some apothecary surgeons who were, came to New Zealand and I haven't done that I'm not sure if anyone knows about it but um, uh, most of the doctors let's say who came to early Dunedin would have been apothecary surgeons I imagine they certainly would not have been physicians you know university trained I don't think so ships doctors for instance um, were all um, apothecary surgeons. That was a, a common thing if a, a young man, of course, um, just graduated and just wanted to see the world, they'd become a, a ship's doctor, or the, in the Royal Navy, usually. Um, anyway. Yeah. yeah. You know, my reference to the last two questions. In 1715, a person by the name of Hanbury, Alan Hanbury, started in 1715. And you might say that pharmacy started separating from apothecaries around about then. Yes. The Quaker family. Yes. The point I would add here, you, you referred to the rebuilding of the Society of Apothecaries. It had burned down during yes. the fire. Yes, yeah, it did. That's right. Fire. That's right. And when they built it again, they added what was called a laboratory, like a laboratory with an E in front. Yeah. And what... Uh, at that time, from 1680s, medicine is described as ex laboratorium pharmaceutica. Yes. Laboratory medicines, mm. now, they, they are the, you might say, the modern day medicine. Yes. So, apothecaries did have a, did have a contribution to make the pharmacology yes. and, and also to what's called pharmacognosy. Yes. Recognizing medicinal activity in yes. initially plants but nowadays yes, uh, yes that's right I mean I, I, as I see it the uh, apothecary surgeons uh, as they became more recognizably modern day um, general practitioners were less interested in manufacturing uh, remedies and more interested in dealing with patients that became more recognizably modern GPs and that's I guess where the pharmacy profession uh, kind of became more specialized because they were involved with the actual science uh, you know I don't think this society of apothecaries were ever much interested in the science of pharmacy as you were saying you know laboratory research and all that kind of stuff so that would have been pharmacy I think yes 
you concentrated on barber surgeons and surgeons and apothecary and yes. maybe family. Yes. What about the physicians? Does the distinction still exist today? Um, well, at the moment, the way it works in, at the moment is that a, a student uh, does their six years of medical training, no matter what they're going to do, to become a general practitioner or to become a surgeon or to become a cardiology physician. So they all do the same training nowadays and they get a degree. Uh, so that innovation came in in the late 1800s, mainly in the University of London. So uh, at that time, the site of apothecaries was licensing medical practitioners, but at the same time, the University of London was coming up and becoming much more influential and giving degrees, you see. And so by the late 1800s, the University of London was giving degrees in medicine. And so they were somewhat in competition with the Society of Apothecaries. So the, the Society of Apothecaries kind of became less influential in terms of licensing and the University of London and subsequently Nottingham and other universities became more influential. Uh, and then, and so nowadays a person then decides to specialise as a physician or a surgeon or a general practitioner. Now they're all specialties. So a physician doesn't do surgery? Generally not, no. No, no. But, so general practitioners, general practice is regarded basically as a, sub, as a specialty in the same way that you have to do quite a long training programme to become a general practitioner. I think it's pretty much the same length of time as uh, to do surgery, really, or anything else. They're Is that correct? Now, Pardon? Well, they're doing procedures. Yes. Yes, yes. So, tell them there's more about that. So, you mean sir, uh, general I mean, practitioners? Do gastroscopy, yes. Do colonoscopy, yes. 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 That's right. That's right. Yes. Yes. That's right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And also, if you find yourself, um, if you work in New Zealand, uh, you specialise in those areas, but if you go to work in the, in the developing world, which uh, this possibly needs to be changed the name of the developing world now, but another part of the world where there are not any, very many doctors, yes. you can finish out doing surgery yes. and doing physician work. Yes. There's a whole lot. Yes. You're right. So. Yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, just while well, I think of that, you know, this is the British scene I'm talking about, and, and maybe a bit New Zealand scene as well, but in, in Germany, on the continent, you know, there are different lines of division. Uh, so there is a female breast surgeon in this hospital, a German one, you'll know who she is, uh, who also is a trained gynecologist. So in Germany, a gynecologist dealing with the female pelvis also does breast surgery. Now that is not the case in New, Z New Zealand or uh, elsewhere, so, but it's different. Yeah, so. The Scottish universities have medical degrees, and then you look at that, and Edinburgh is yes, 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 of course, yes. Which is descended from the European system. Yes, yes. And, and of course, founded many. That's of course, yes, so that's medical right. associations around the world. Yes. The other thing I'd like to say is that we went to the physical in the mid-70s and uh, I was fascinated and it's relevant to our particular kind of country at this point in time it, that they had a, they had a, a wonderful, um, wonderful collection of medicinal plants, but particularly mm. the uh, Opium poppies, which were all numbered. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Opium poppies were numbered, yeah. and the uh, marijuana leaves mm. were all numbered mm. so that nobody could steal them. <laughs> yes. Yes, because marijuana was used a lot for making rope, wasn't it? Hemp. And um, so it was quite popularly cultivated. Yeah, interesting. Yes. Yeah. Actually, the story about the. Um, people doing different things. We worked for a time when we were in Africa with a Russian trained dentist. And we had quite a lot of discussion with him because he, their training enabled them to deal with gastric ulcers because it went in through the mouth. Anything yes. that went in through the mouth was dealt with by the dentist. Yes, 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 yes. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks so much. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks.
Okay.